Tapalev, Agus Faisugu Taitaski Gierloch. Thank you everyone for coming this evening and a warm welcome to anyone who's new to a Gerloch Museum event. My name is Karen Buchanan. I'm curator at Gerloch Museum and I would just like to point out that support for tonight has come from Museums Gallery Scotland and from the Art Fund. Now we had Dr Matt Knight speak to us about the pool you hoard last winter and the recording of that talk online has had a tremendous response with over 400 views. So with Alison Dunlop's exhibition currently running in the museum, and a fabulous exhibition it is, exploring the Shant Isles, we thought it would be the ideal time to have someone share with us the story of the precious Minch Torque, which is at National Museums of Scotland. And to our great benefit, Matt was available to talk to us again. On to the, the main event, and I have great pleasure in introducing Dr. Matthew Knight. Uh, Matt is Senior Curator of Prehistory at National Museum Scotland, and he has particular research interest in how people made, used and deposited objects. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, and thank you all for coming along today. It's an absolute pleasure to uh, be back here uh, virtually. Maybe one day I will actually be at the museum uh, giving a presentation in person. But for now, you are joining me in my kitchen. So um, tonight, I will be talking to you about the wonderful Minch Talk this gold object that you see on your screen here, uh, dredged up from uh, the Minch near the Chantiles. And I'm gonna use this object and the story of this object as a springboard for talking about what else is happening in Bronze Age Britain and Ireland at this time um, and explore some of these other avenues before uh, rounding back towards uh, some of the interpretations that go along with this object. And um, it's a great uh, story of discovery that begins with scallops. And some of you may already uh, know this story um, and, uh, and uh, you may know it from Adam Nicholson's uh, beautifully written Sea Room in which he, he, um, he presents it, but I'll try and do my best to do it half as eloquently as, as he does. It begins in early 1991 when uh, two uh, fishermen were out uh, dredging for scallops, Donald McSween and Kenny Cunningham. And uh, they were uh, trawling for scallops just off the, just off the Chantiles in, the, in that stretch of the Minch between Lewis and Skye. And uh, they pulled up this gold wire or uh, I think at the time they weren't aware it was gold, but they pulled up this, this twisted wire, an elongated uh, bar with uh, hooks at the end. And it seems they thought uh, nothing much of it. It ended up in a toolbox and um, there it sat for the better part of a year until I believe it was uh, Kenny Cunningham watching Antiques Roadshow saw something that looked rather similar. And as it, happened he was on his way to Glasgow for another affair um, and he thought he'd take it with him and uh, show it to an auctioneer at, at the auction house Christie's in Glasgow where the person he showed it to seemed to react quite strongly to it and uh, took it and instantly bent it into the curved shape that it is today um, recognizing it as, as something of, of great value it then got bundled into a briefcase and carted off to the National Museum in Scot uh, of Scotland in Edinburgh, where my, um, my predecessor, Trevor Carey, who's in the audience here tonight, uh, reportedly almost died uh, in the account that Adam Nicholson uh, presents. Um, and from there, it entered into uh, the general kind of legal process that goes along with these chance finds. Um, if, it, if such a find comes up on land, it gets reported through treasure trove unit and um, 
declared treasure. And if it comes up from the sea, it, as in the case of the Minch talk, it gets reported to receiver of the wreck and it's considered wreck. Uh, regardless of whether it comes up from sea or on land, uh, these are considered ownerless goods. It's unless an owner can uh, step forward and claim the object. And I particularly love the way that uh, uh, Adam Nicholson presented this as the find waiting for a naked dripping bronze chieftain to come out of the mint to claim his gold, his or her talk. Um, of course, this didn't happen. The find was uh, declared treasure and or declared wreck rather, and uh, was acquired by the National Museum of Scotland, where it's been on display in our early people gallery since 1998. So that's the story of its discovery. And yet, I haven't actually told you what it is. Um, call it a, a talk, and by that I mean essentially a, a neck ring. It's a particular style of object that dates uh, to the Middle Bronze Age, and it's about three and a bit thousand years, years old. Um, these things come in many different sizes, some of them particularly large and heavy, and some of them uh, a bit smaller. The Minch Talk is, sits on the, the lighter end of that scale, but it, it's still a hefty piece of gold. Um, it's about 18 centimeters in diameter, and weighs roughly 140 grams. So it's no, it's no mean feat to have lost this amount of gold, um, not to have acquired, produced, and then lost this amount of gold, I should say. We can interrogate this object further. We can ask questions about the origin of the gold and how this object was made. Analysis has been uh, undertaken on the gold by Dr. Peter Northover, formerly of the University of Oxford. And he found that the composition of the gold is about 14 to 15% silver, as well as three to 4% copper and a small amount of tin. You don't need to remember these percentages, but there is a reason for pointing them out. The, um, the production of gold at this time uh, was in its fairly early stages, uh, in its first few, uh, first millennium of, it, of inception, and it wasn't a time of refining gold heavily. So uh, and we're also dealing with a period that wasn't uh, exploiting silver in Bronze Age Britain and Ireland at this time. So the silver that's present in the, in the talk hasn't been refined, it hasn't been alloyed, it's probably naturally occurring. And that's important because uh, 14 to 15% silver that's present in the uh, Minch Gold talk allows us to start to narrow down some of the possible sources that this gold comes from because gold occurs with various degrees of elements depending on where it comes up and that sort of level of silver uh, naturally alloyed with gold points to probably a Welsh or Irish origin but it's a little bit more complicated than that because the small amounts of copper and tin that are also present are a little bit higher than what you would expect from a naturally occurring alloy. So that suggests that they've been deliberately added to the mix. So what that means is you've essentially got someone cutting their flour with chalk. They've decided to try and make the gold stretch a little bit further by adding a little bit of bronze. And this means that it's quite difficult to pinpoint exactly where the gold had, has come from and there's further analysis that could be done. But it also tells us that people are acquiring gold and they're stretching it as a material, they're recycling it, they're adding bits to it, and people understand the material as well. They haven't added huge amounts of bronze because that would radically devalue and change the structure of the material. This is still mostly gold um, and gold as we know it. We can also uh, do investigations into how it was made, and this shines a light on the, the craftspeople of the Bronze Age and their incredible uh, feats of skill that went into making objects such as this. And here I'm indebted to uh, Dr. Armbruster, uh, who is not only an expert on Bronze Age gold in Europe, but she's also a trained goldsmith in her own right. And so she, um, she uh, has some fantastic insights into the craftspeople of Bronze Age Britain and Ireland, and objects such as the Minch Talk would have been hammered out from a single 
uh, a single gold ingot, ingot stretched into a bar, probably square sectioned, and then the corners would have been hammered up in, to form slightly pointed corners that we call flanges. Um, and then, then the bar would have been twisted. You can't twist the gold too much, else you cause it to break. So you have to anneal it. So you heat the, heat the gold to relieve the stress, and then you're able to keep twisting. And it's this repetitive action of twisting and heating um, that allows you to get the, um, this twisted effect. And you can really see the craft involved here, um, particularly on this, this um, right-hand side. The tighter the twists and tighter the coils, the more skilled the process. Um, and some of these looser twists that you see towards the left may in fact just be the result of the fact that it was banging around on the bottom of the, of the minch for a, a fair while. We can also see uh, elements of um, how the terminals were produced and previously and for other comparable objects, it's been suspected that these may have been cast on or perhaps even soldered, but uh, it's clear that these uh, this is this entire object is produced from a single bar of bronze, which means that they're twisting only the center part and then elaborately making these hooked terminals that would have allowed you to, to clasp the torque around your neck. So in conclusion, it's a rather lovely object and um, it is beautifully made and tells us uh, lots about um, the production and circulation of gold at this time. We can uh, take it and go a step further um, by thinking about where it sits in time and space generally in Bronze Age Britain and Ireland. So although the, mi the Minch talk hasn't come from a closely datable context, the style of the object allows us to place it here in and around the end of the Middle Bronze Age, 1300 to 1100 BC, give or take. And this is, uh, uh, we can hone in on this date because of the manufacturing style, as well as how, um, how and when similar objects have been found um, in more closely datable contexts. And so we can then think about what is happening in, uh, uh, how many of these are going on at this time? How many of these are being deposited at this time in Britain? And uh, the Minch sits at the very northern fringes of the distribution map of these objects. Most of them have been recovered or were deposited in Eastern Ireland, scattering across Wales, Southern Central and Eastern England, and also across Atlantic Fran France and further south into Iberia. This map produced by George Ogan in 1994 uh, lists about 90 um, but since 1994, we've uh, recovered, or several more have been recovered from across Ireland and Britain, and though no further examples are known from Scotland, most of what most of the most of the discoveries that have been made fall within this general distribution pattern. So let's see what we can say about the four talks from Scotland, the Minch being one. Um, not a lot, it's safe to say. The uh, Minch talk is uh, remarkable, not just for its discovery, but for also being the only surviving gold talk from, from Scotland. We know very little about uh, the example that was recovered from Stonykirk in Wigtonshire, uh, slightly more about the one from Lays in, in, um, near Inverness. This was a fragment of a, of a gold talk, um, a small twisted fragment with a hook terminal, apparently found near a chambered cairn, but uh, the chambered cairn almost certainly would have predated the object by um, a millennium or more. And that was uh, melted down or lost uh, somewhere, somewhere along the way. The example from Slateford came up during construction work on a railway. And uh, the image you see on the right is of that object, but uh, that was indeed melted down for the value of the gold and a cast was made, though uh, it's probably not a particularly reliable cast. It seems to have been made from two wires twisted around each other 
and in reality this was almost certainly some sort of bar twisted talk similar to the Minch talk but actually would have been much larger. So unfortunately we can't say very much about the context of these finds nor um, nor study them firsthand to draw comparisons and they're quite widely spread across Scotland anyway. So we need to explore a little bit further and we can look at other examples from this time in Britain and Ireland. In um, uh, We have a nice example here from Grunty Fen pulled from, from the Fenlands of Cambridgeshire uh, around the same time that about three or four other bronze axes were pulled up and also a lovely example here from Yeovil in Somerset. You'll notice that these are of a slightly different style to the to the minch chalk. Their flanges are slightly more pronounced. They will have hammered the bar into a bit more of a cross section before twisting it. Um, but essentially it's variations on a theme as, um, as far as we're concerned. One thing to note, and you may have noted this of the Slateford one as well, these are coiled. Um, and I'm going to come back to that point uh, shortly. Um, but first, let's look at this example from uh, Corrad in Northern Ireland. Another recent find uh, pulled up from um, pulled up from boggy ground in Northern Ireland around 2009. In, and these sorts of finds are quite important because uh, most of what I've shown you so far have come from the 18th and early 19th century um, and we rarely get a chance to kind of understand their their precise context. Um, so any information we can gain from them is, is particularly important. However, this one shares a little bit of a parallel with the Minch talk in that uh, when it was recovered, it wasn't recognised for what it was. I believe the finder thought it might have been a spring for a vintage car and uh, came up in 2009, went into a drawer for a couple of years when the finder was then looking through a treasure hunting magazine, recognised for what it might actually be, and it was then reported to National Museums uh, of Northern Ireland, and it's now in the collections of Ulster Museum. And again, it's one of these lovely uh, flanged examples, and again, it's coiled. And Greer Ramsey has suggested that perhaps this coiling is part of a decommissioning act. It's a way of um, it's a way of putting these talks out of action and a way of, um, of them no longer being worn around the neck or in this case, potentially around the waist. This one would have had a diameter uh, more than double the size of um, the minch talk. And I mentioned the minch talk was 140-ish grams. This one is uh, 730 grams. It's um, six-ish times the weight of the minch talk in gold. Um, alternatively, um, the coiling may actually relate to how they were worn. We don't, we've never found one of these associated with the body. So whilst we assume they're to be worn around the neck or perhaps around the waist, um, I wonder uh, if these may actually be worn on the arm, coiled round um, uh, the lower arm or upper arm, although I must admit, it doesn't look like it would be particularly comfortable. We have a couple of other examples here from, from Tara. These were found in 1810 by a, by a uh, boy digging close to the, the ring forts at Tara. And these are quite remarkable because their uh, terminals have been elaborated and the picture doesn't really do justice to the size of these things. The larger one towards the bottom is over 850 grams of gold. Again, huge amounts of gold to be uh, putting into the ground. And a recent find made uh, by metal detecting from, um, uh, from East Cambridgeshire. This uh, example, again, several hundred, uh, 700 grams of gold. So these are hefty big objects and I share this one uh, partly because it's a recent find it's come up uh, came up in 2016 by metal detecting not too far from the grunt grunty fen example that I, I mentioned earlier but also because there's some fantastic interpretation that goes with this 
heavy tops of this sort of size are suggested they may have been worn around the waist. And in this case, one of the suggestions was it may have even wrapped around an animal such as a pig. And I love the idea of a pig running around with a giant gold torque around its belly. Um, so maybe these torques are lost because the animals ran off with them. Most of what I've shown you so far has been, uh, have been single finds, much like the minch talk. So we know that they were deposited in, uh, in isolation, but we also have them coming up in group deposits, so-called hordes. Here we have one from Taragnac in Cornwall, a series of rather beautiful objects, but also rather intriguing objects because uh, we talked a little bit about uh, the metalworking uh, prowess involved in making them. This is almost um, a metal worker showing us exactly how he made all these different objects. We have finished and unfinished examples. We have some really lovely intricate work of the twisted, uh, twisted bars that were then molded into terminals. And really importantly, we have almost a graded weight system within this hoard where the torques and bars are in sets of 30 grams, 60, 60 grams, 90 grams. So this not only tells us about uh, the types of objects being made, but also that there was a fundamental understanding of weights of gold at this time, and things were being set into uh, certain weight values. Um, I should say that these examples from Cornwall were actually quite light by comparison. Um, you know, one that only weighs about uh, the two biggest talks only weigh about 90 to 95 grams each. Not everything is quite so structured. Here again, we have a variation of, on a theme, the Pretty Horde from Somerset. It's a collection of, uh, of unusual bar bracelets and bar talks, some of them sheets, uh, ribbon sheets of gold, and some of them not in the conventional square or even round cross section, but actually in a triangular cross section. So we can see people playing around with the style in the Middle Bronze Age, which um, is actually uh, completely fascinating to see how different regions are, are doing these sorts of things. The Pretty Horde has another story to tell though, because we mentioned uh, already that there was possible acts of decommissioning happening at and around this time with gold talks. The Pretty Horde is a classic example of that because all 19 of these bracelets and talks have been cr were crushed into a ball before they were deposited. So if we're talking about the abandonment of wealth, for instance, we've got a really intriguing deposit here where people are just crushing gold together um, and burying it um, somewhere in their landscape. Unfortunately, we don't have a photographic record of the Pretty Horde uh, in, its, in its context, but we do actually have a remarkably similar find from Hayop in Wales, came up in the 1950s. And this is an example of the talks as they came out of the ground. And this is three ribbon talks that were crushed into a ball. So it really gives you a sense of the, the weird and wonderful things that people are doing with these gold objects at this time. It's not just gold that's deposited together. There's also mix, mixtures of objects being, um, being buried. And again, another hoard that contributes to this wider picture, the hoard from Burton, at Burton in uh, Northern Wales. And you can see here at the center, another coiled twisted torque, as well as a range of really intricately made gold objects including one that presents some of the earliest evidence of solder in Bronze Age Northwestern Europe. It was also deposited with uh, a chisel and a couple of axes, and the whole thing seems to have been buried in a ceramic vessel. And um, this is the remains of that pot on the left-hand side here, but it seems to have been destroyed by the plow or disintegrated. And one of the suggestions for the coiling is not that it's a decommissioning act, it's a way of concealing the object. And certainly if you wanted to put one of these torques into a, into a uh, pottery, uh, pottery vessel, perhaps this was the way to do it. And it may have been a way of safekeeping. They certainly would have had the skills to unravel it carefully and put it back into use afterwards. In that sense, it's not really decommissioning, it's more, um, it's more temporary 
it's more temporary than um, a permanent act. What is a slightly more permanent act is this practice of uh, fragmenting talks, which is increasingly being recognized. Many of the 90 uh, or so examples that I showed you from 1994 uh, across that map were recovered in a complete condition uh, with varying signs of, of wear and repair. But the increased uh, activities of metal workers in, uh, sorry, not metal workers, metal detectorists in southern Britain, uh, uh, in and around Wales and also across southern England, uh, are repeatedly finding these small fragments of gold talks. And they're clearly um, portions of uh, portions of the much larger objects that we've seen but they've been deliberately clipped many of them have chisel marks uh, many of them show signs of having been hammered and there's various theories for why we have so many of these objects coming up I mean I, you see here just a scattering uh, of of them um, some of the suggestions is that they're being cut up to be thrown into a crucible for melting and in some cases that's probably true you see in the top right hand corner that you've actually got three um, three fragments of torques that have been melted together probably as part of the casting process but I think it's unlikely that all of these are are um, losses as a result of casting activity I think if we're considering gold as a particularly valuable material at this time um, it seems unlikely that people are are losing these these fragments and occasionally they show up in hordes as well and we're going to see a particularly striking example um, in a couple of slides it's but I think it's part of a wider practice of how people are treating talks before they're put in the ground and it may be in these cases what we're seeing is an expression by people who can't afford to give up the entire object. It's a practice referred to as pars pro toto, where you deposit a portion of an object as a, as, a, um, as a symbol of the whole. This is something that's still being explored, but we can also think that there are historic discoveries of this. This isn't a newly found phenomenon. Uh, the, the example from Culloden, for instance, was indeed a fragment, and it seems striking that one of the four talks known from Scotland is actually a fragmented example. So um, it's a case of watch this space um, for now with these. Let's step away from gold for a minute and let's talk more about uh, what else is happening in the Middle Bronze Age. Let's try and put uh, the gold work and the minch talk into the context of of life in Middle Bronze Age Scotland. And we're gonna focus on Scotland uh, particularly, but there's, these are representative of general patterns that are happening elsewhere. So we're dealing with uh, small farming communities. These, uh, uh, they're reliant on agriculture, pastoralism, uh, fishing in some cases, uh, particularly in and around the islands. They're living in uh, small huts and small roundhouses, sometimes in uh, villages or sometimes in individual farmsteads. They have field systems that they manage. In the um, Outer Hebrides, there's examples of, um, examples of middens dating from around this time, accumulations of charcoal and animal bone, fish bones, uh, pottery, and generally the, the debitage of, of settlements. Essentially, what I'm saying is we're not dealing with um, uh, we're, we're not dealing with, for want of a better word, primitive communities. These are actively engaged communities. They're uh, relatively wealthy um, in terms of their, their lifestyles, and they're also well connected people. We have evidence from at least the early Bronze Age and indeed before, so in the centuries preceding uh, this era, we have. Um, um, we have evidence that people are traveling great distances uh, across the North Sea, uh, up along the, the Irish Sea, the Atlantic facade. We know that people are trading and exchanging objects. The gold trade uh, that will have brought the minch talk from well, Wales or Ireland up into 
into the mint uh, was part of a wider system that traded other materials as well. These spanned across and around Scotland. Um, so um, this gives you a, a sense of, of who the people were. We all, we're still um, understanding a little bit about what, what sort of hierarchies were in place within society at this time. Um, we don't have evidence from burials, uh, much evidence of burials at this time. It seems to be a communal activity where everyone was cremated for the most part and buried in, in an urn or a pottery vessel of some kind. And we don't have any particular elaborate burials that might suggest elites. And uh, we also don't have huge enclosures or huge defences being built, but we do have the emergence of swords and shields and um, for want of a better word, symbols of power um, to coin the uh, 1980s exhibition at uh, National Museum Scotland. The, um, these were items uh, that communicated it, uh, a status and to own one of these objects and then uh, would have been uh, a particularly uh, strong symbol. Uh, and uh, the Minch talk is one of those to my mind particularly in, in the context of how few there are known from Scotland. We know that, uh, however, we're not dealing with uh, a particularly uh, prolific depositional record in Scotland at this time, certainly not by comparison with what's happening further south. Rare, uh, rare pieces of other Middle Bronze Age gold are these bracelets um, and smaller rings found in a cremation urn in Banffshire. Other bits of metalwork going into the ground include uh, axes, tools, um, weapons, grooming objects, as well as beads um, and other fine items. Um, but overall, uh, this is, is relatively limited and most of what's being put in the ground is single finds uh, of many of these objects. There's not the hoarding of wealth in the same way that there is further south. And, I, and yet we know that from earlier periods and indeed later periods, metal and uh, other prestige goods were moving in and around Scotland and were being deposited in uh, great numbers. So, uh, and we also know that Scotland was well connected. So I suspect what we're seeing here, this relatively limited practice of deposition in and around the end of the second millennium BC, what I think we're seeing is actually a community that is less concerned with depositing its objects. It's, and there may be any number of reasons for that. It may be resource driven. It may be that people um, are valuing their materials and can't afford to deposit them. Uh, or it may just be part of the wider belief system that that's not what is done further north in the same way that it is in the south of Britain. Let's move on to perhaps uh, one of the bigger questions that people want to know with the Minch talk. Um, and that is, what was it doing in the sea? We've talked a little bit here about uh, what's happening on land, but we also need to explore more about what's happening on the water. And in the Bronze Age, I've already mentioned that uh, we're looking at well-connected communities and we have varying evidence of this at different times. Um, you see here on your right evidence uh, of how people crossed uh, bigger bodies of water, the Dover boat, which dates to around or slightly before the, the, the date of the Minch talk. It's a sewn plank boat, would have been crewed by a large number of people and capable of transversing at least uh, the English Channel. Um, we have other log boats uh, uh, other types of boats that have been found from much earlier. Uh, various log boats are known from across Scotland and Ireland at this time. And we also have uh, skinned boats and, and uh, coracles. Um, but I think we should, uh, we should remember that at this time, the drive to, uh, the drive to move was also matched by 
the dangers of the sea. You know, the sea uh, was no less dangerous then than it is today, and particularly areas such as the Minch, where it um, is possible to to run into trouble if you don't uh, if you're not expecting it. Um, it these would have been dangerous places for people to travel, um, and we can sometimes get glimpses of the uh, symbolism of the sea through objects that you see on your left hand side here, the Kargooli Bowl from North Wales, deposited along the River Allen, um, a major route into North Wales from Ireland. And this is uh, a quite an incredible object dating a little bit before the Minch Talk, a century or two earlier. And it's produced from shale and gold, um, and some of the gold is wrapped around aspects of tin. And it's believed to represent a boat um, these uh, zigzags at the bottom have been interpreted as waves and these triangular bits coming down have been interpreted as oars. And I, I think this is a, a really important find because it communicates some of the symbolism that goes with the sea and seafaring and how it was viewed at this time. It was an important activity for trading and exchanging objects, but also a very revered activity as well. I mean, there's a lot of skill involved in making these things, um, as well as navigating and um, avoiding any uh, traumatic end to your vessel. And we do have potential evidence of shipwrecks at this time. Um, two sites in particular seem to suggest that what we're dealing with is cargoes of material that are being traveled transported across the English Channel, and they seem to have run aground. Um, and these have been recovered through the work of scuba divers. What you see on your screen here is a selection, a selection of objects that have been pulled up from Moor Sands in Salcombe Bay off the south coast of Devon. There's another important site from Langdon Bay off the coast of Kent. The Langdon Bay uh, find runs into several hundreds of objects, as does the Salcombe Bay find. And uh, whilst the Langdon Bay find seems to be uh, a single isolated incident, the material from Salcombe seems to suggest at least two events where material has ended up in the sea. A lot of what's, what's been recovered is ingots. There's about 280 copper ingots and 40 tin ingots recovered from the seabed. It's a remarkable amount of material to have lost, um, but it wasn't just those objects that were being transported. It's complete axes, complete weapons, but crucially here, fragments of torques. And I think this is really important in the context of the single finds that we saw earlier, because it shows that the objects aren't just being cut up and then lost. They're actually uh, being moved around. And I think that adds to the story of how we can interpret the single finds that are being buried on land. Strikingly, we actually know very, uh, we actually have very little metalwork that's been recovered from the sea. The, those examples that I've just shown you uh, are generally interpreted as shipwrecks, but there's some theory to suggest that they may have been uh, actual deliberate deposits. It's a huge wealth of material to have ended up in the sea. And some of the theories come from the fact that we don't see um, evidence of the ships themselves, though we are, of course, dealing with material that's three to three and a half thousand years old. Um, and we don't fully understand how the sea affects preservation records, um, even though uh, people have thoroughly excavated these areas. Um, and uh, number three on your uh, screen here um, is the more sands uh, Salcombe material that I've just shown you, and number 15 is the Langdon Bay uh, material. And then you've got this whole series of other finds across the southern British coast. And it's quite striking, almost all the finds we have from the sea are from along this coast. There's very few others around Britain and Ireland. The Minch Talk is a rare exception. And here I want to draw your attention to just one more find from the sea, um, which is quite striking. This, uh, this is a pair of uh, twisted talks of Sotteville-sur-Mer, um, and these have 
been uh, suggested as deliberate deposits in the sea. And of course, uh, this draws a curious a parallel with what we see from the Minch. Um, and, uh, and also another interesting feature of these two talks dating to around the same time is that uh, their terminals, the terminals of each of them have been clipped off at one end. Um, so we may be looking here at a more deliberate practice than previously considered. And adding to this theory, we can also talk about metalwork that's coming up from other places from throughout the Bronze Age and indeed later. Um, the boats that you would use to cross the sea are of course very different from the boats you would need along rivers. And here on the left, you see the Carpoo log boat from the Tay um, on display in Perth Museum. And it's uh, the Tay is particularly interesting because uh, quite a large amount of metalwork has been recovered from it, spanning the early Bronze Age through to the late Bronze Age and indeed later. Uh, objects such as swords and spears and uh, socketed axes. Uh, about 10 or so objects have been recovered, but we see similar amounts coming from elsewhere. And uh, some of the major rivers of Britain and Ireland, uh, notably the River Shannon, the River Thames and the River Trent, have produced large amounts of metalwork to the point that we can't just claim that these are accidental losses um, over the edge of a ship or over the edge of a boat. Um, the Thames, for instance, has about 140 pieces of Bronze Age metalwork that's, that has so far been recovered. So to wrap up my talk, let's go to the big question that I'm sure most of you want to know is why was the Minch talk deposited? And we can draw on the wealth of information that I've uh, presented over the last 40 minutes or so to start to um, get some idea about uh, what would have gone into this process. Uh, you'll be disappointed to hear that, of course, we're never going to know the answer. Uh, we're never going to know how a, this piece of gold jewellery ended up at the bottom of the Minch three and a half thousand years ago. However, having looked at uh, the other sorts of treatments that are happening with talks across Britain and Ireland at this time, as well as thinking about the importance of the sea, we can, uh, it starts to lead us towards the conclusion that this may in fact be a more deliberate practice. It is entirely possible it was accidentally lost on a crossing uh, of the Minch. It's entirely possible that the uh, boat may have run aground uh, on the, the uh, rocks of the Chantiles. Um, and this went overboard. But I think looking at what else is happening in, in Middle Bronze Age Britain and Ireland at this time, it's likely it's more symbolic. It's likely an offering to the sea. It's a big status uh, symbol, um, uh, particularly in Scotland when seemingly so few of these were in circulation. It's a product of trade and exchange networks. And of course, um, on a bad day, the Minch can be pretty problematic to cross. Um, so maybe uh, maybe uh, this was put overboard as an offering for a safe crossing. Um, and of course, uh, mythologies last into today. And I couldn't resist ending this talk on the blue men of the Minch, these Kelpies uh, that will have overturned ships. And perhaps what this talk was uh, was an offering to Bronze Age Blue Men. Um, and on that note, I want to uh, thank you all for listening and thank you particularly to uh, the various people who have provided additional info. Um, and also I would like to direct your attention to a project led by Alison Sheridan and Jana Hook on prehistoric gold in Britain at this time. Um, and I urge you to go and have a look at some of the resources available there if I've kind of sparked your imagination with Bronze Age Gold. And thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. That was just fascinating. Um, and judging by the comments in the chat, it, it's not just me that's, uh, that's found that. Uh, you, you've actually already answered um, 
the first question, I think, well, partly about any legends or stories associated with the Minch Torque. So, um, not that I'm, yeah, none that I'm particularly aware of. Um, but okay. I, I, you know, you see the blue men kind of come up from time to time, and yeah. particularly in association with them with the Minch Talk. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's not that long since it's been found, is it? So. No, 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 not. Well, it's enough time for legends to form. <laughs> so Emeritus is, first of all, saying um, thanks, Matt, Matt that, that she really enjoyed the talk. But she's asking about the standardised units of weight that you mentioned and whether it would be the same uh, with fragments. Are the fragments also found to, in, in these standardised units of weight? Um, it's entirely possible. It's a subject of um, of a project that's happening at the moment, uh, actually based out of Central Europe, and they're looking at Bronze Age weight systems across the whole of Europe. And gold is one of those things that they're investigating by taking these these weights of fragments into account. And they're finding that uh, there are rough patterns that people are are using. It doesn't seem to be. Uh, a particularly precise method. It's more to do with what looks about right and what feels about right. And these units seem to be running at around 10 grams at a time. And we also have to take into account the practicalities of how big are crucibles at this time. Um, gold crucibles are generally quite small. And so you need these clipped fragments to be quite small to fit in there. Um, but uh, it's also, yeah, it's entirely possible that we are looking at some sort of standardization. But interestingly, we don't see that with bronze. The research that's going on at the moment seems to suggest that it's gold that's being standardized, increasingly standardized over time in a way that bronze isn't. Bronze is much more um, kind of that looks about right. So we'll just, we'll go with that. Um, but it's a really interesting question and I'm afraid I don't have, a, have an answer for it, but it certainly seems that there's a concept of weights and weighing and I think the fragments will fit into that, but um, the clear line between what's functional and what's not is is obviously quite blurred in the Bronze Age. I, I went to see the Galloway Horde on display at MMS recently, and of course there's the same phenomenon with that, with, with silver, isn't that right? Yeah, the hack silver of the Viking Age, which, um, well, and before the Viking Age, that we know are being done to standardized weights. Um, yeah, this is, a, this is where we, we are limited by the fact that the Bronze Age people didn't write anything down or leave us any uh, any nice weighing scales to, to work from. Yeah. Uh, Carlos asking whether it might have been part of a burial at sea. So mm. the, the deposition of a, a body and, and not just the torque. Sure, why not? Um, <laughs> it's, it, we, we know that people uh, People are doing lots of things with their dead at this time. And uh, some of the metal work uh, that I mentioned from Rivers has, uh, has also come up with various skulls. And when they date those skulls, they line up pretty closely with the metal work that they're being recovered from. And we have evidence from uh, other rivers where um, uh, that human remains date to these middle to late Bronze Age periods. They also date later. Uh, it's impossible to say, but we certainly don't have enough burials for the amount of people we know were being buried at this time. So they must be doing something with their dead. And uh, the sea is as good a place as any um, for, for burial. And it would explain exactly why, it would explain why we have so few bodies buried on land as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm open to that theory. Uh, Tom's asking whether a piece like the torque would be passed down through generations as mm. uh, perhaps as a symbol of leadership? Yeah, um, again, entirely possible. It, we know that that sort of thing is happening at this time. We have evidence of objects that certainly look like heirlooms, um, particularly from earlier periods. The evidence, uh, there's not quite so much evidence in the, in the Middle Bronze Age, but uh, we do have instances of objects that are being 
that are clearly much older than the, the instance in which they're being deposited. It's another one of my, um, it's another one of my kind of interests is, is this idea of heirlooms in the Bronze Age or in other periods of, of time. Uh, if you make an object like that, uh, you're probably going to want to keep it and metal, of course, will out, outweigh, um, uh, sorry, outlast the, um, outlast the person wearing it. So yes, it's entirely possible. Um, Anna here is wondering why you haven't mentioned the Loch Broom Torque that's at National Museum Scotland. Um, because um, I uh, am not hugely familiar with the Loch Broom talk, I must admit. Trevor, Trevor Cowie knows about it, he showed it to me. Loch Broom, Anna, the, the Loch Broom, the Loch Broom talk, talk is, is a different type, it's a ribbon talk, and those are now considered to be Iron Age mostly. All right. Right. Yes. Sorry. I, um, this is, this is um, something that's changed over the last uh, 10, 15 years or so. A lot of what was once considered Middle Bronze Age they, has been looked at from a technological standpoint, and it's now considered Iron Age um, because of the different techniques that are being used in their production. So the lock broom talk must be one of those, and I've just completely overlooked it um, uh, for my sins, and that's a... <laughs> uh, that's uh, bad on me um but yes we we have had a radical changing in how we think about the middle bronze age gold work of of scotland in in the last few years um and this being one of those things where we used to think there was a lot of gold from scotland from this period and now there's actually surprisingly little thank you yeah and thank you for the question anna yeah thank you um trevor while we have you on I wonder if you could maybe just say a little bit about what, how you felt when you actually saw the torque the first time. As Matt said, and as Adam said in Sea Room, um, I almost fell off my perch when um, uh, Miranda Grant from Chris, Christie's brought in the, the torque um, one otherwise dull day. Um, but uh, I didn't quite die. As you can see, rumours of my early death of, uh, are, are, are not, not true. Um, so I think uh, it was certainly a remarkable find and it uh, introduced me to the intricacies of the receiver of REC system, um, which Matt has explained this evening. Um, it's similar to Treasure Trove, but um, uh, it, it is a, uh, as, Adam, as Adam said in the book, um, you're left with this problem of ownerless objects um, and dealing with finds from the sea or the seashore, um, the chances of finding the owner, the original owner, in the case of antiquities, are nil. Um, so it was a great find. Um, again, as Matt said, the, um, but when Kenny and Donald's original found it, um, it didn't really make a great impression on them. Um, so our chances of getting back to the area of sea um, are virtually nil. Um, I think at best we're looking at several square kilometers. Um, so if we are looking at a wreck, um, it's, it's like a needle in a haystack. Um, so I think um, my, my view would be that we can look at a combination of explanations. You know, if we have something like a, a, a ship in stormy weather, then you could see how an offering um, could still be made to the sea. Uh, and so you've got this combination of explanations. So, uh, but it was a great find and uh, well done to Kenny and Donald for eventually, well, Kenny for eventually recognizing that they had uh, in their uh, toolbox of the boat something of real significance. Yeah, yeah thank you, Trevor. And you just reminded me of the 
case of the brighter treasure in Ireland as well, which is also gold, but um, later Iron Age, I think, and where there was a, um, a, a very famous kind of case of, of dispute over ownership, whether it had been, I think, deposited at sea or, or buried on land, um, depended on where it eventually ended up. <clears throat> yeah. So we've got another couple of questions here for Matt. Um, Linda was asking whether the clipped pieces of Torx could be used as a form of currency, perhaps, for triage? Yeah, potentially. It's, uh, we know very little about how, how the economy worked at this time. You know, is it a barter system? Is it interpersonal gift exchange? Uh, I don't think people were wandering around with clipped gold torques in their pocket ready to buy bread or anything like that. But uh, perhaps if you're looking you're in the market for something more expensive, a clipped clip talk buys you an axe or a sword, perhaps. Or, yeah. you know, we, yeah, unfortunately, we don't know. Um, and then that begs the question, why are they in the ground? Um, and then perhaps you're getting into ideas of, of uh, safekeeping, concealing money and the rest of it. It's it's a fascinating topic that we're still we're still just trying to get our heads around because until now we've not really recognized the single clipped finds as a phenomenon in their own right and yet there's vast outnumbering the com complete examples so um yeah we have a we have a long way to go with this topic um M meredith was wanting to clarify whether the Torque was fastened using the terminals. Uh, possibly. How it was fastened. Yeah. Uh, it's generally assumed that the, the two uh, hooks would have just gone, you know, around the back of the neck and hooked up that way. But uh, we've never found one with a body. Uh, we do find them interlinked. Uh, the Tara Torques, for instance, were were interlinked when, when discovered. Um, yeah, again, it's... Um, yeah, it, it's a possibility. And I see that she also asks about the spiral ones as arm rings. That's, that's one of my thoughts, is that they may actually be the way you wear them. You know, they get wrapped, coiled around your arm. Uh, they wouldn't have been the most comfortable things, but we all wear things that aren't all that comfortable. So um, it's, um, it's entirely possible. I think, again, people are doing similar things for many number of reasons. Um, it's probably the best way to describe it. And certainly when you're carry something you might as well have it wrapped around your body as well yeah yeah entirely uh, uh, exactly um you might as well have it on on your person in some way uh people have suggested that for concealing things a really interesting phenomenon that uh predates uh these talks um is the neck rings of the of the early bronze age they're these sheet lunuli and this really thin sheet gold that would have gone around the around the neck these don't there's clasps at the ends of these, but they don't seem to have really fitted. So it's possible that they were strung up. But I mention these because there's evidence that those were being rolled and unrolled repeatedly. And we have evidence that some of them were being deposited rolled up. There's a couple from Scotland uh, predating the talks by several hundred years, but they were rolled up and one of them's described as rolled like a scroll. And it gives you this idea that um, people were, were treating these things in, a, in very peculiar ways that we, we haven't got our heads around, you know. And a torque could certainly have been coiled up and then uncoiled, you know, and yeah. particularly if you're transporting it and you don't want to be roaming around with a big thing around your neck, um, attracting attention. So I think there's a kind of slightly long lived phenomenon of how you treat these things that may be in place here. Yeah, that's fascinating. Well, I don't see any other questions. And I think um, as it's half eight we're probably reaching the end of our time together anyway so i would like to sincerely thank matt as i'm sure everyone else would with maybe a virtual uh, a wave or applause for enlightening us not just about the the torque but uh, the 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 bronze age and 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 at this time and the context uh, of its creation and use thank you again matt sincerely and lovely to have you all with us and enjoy the rest of your evening.